It may not look it, but this is the car that nearly killed BMW. It's one of the most notable automotive failures in history, and a machine that proves that there can be too much of a good thing. It's beautiful, crisp, and delicately styled, but delivers power and comfort that easily meets the standards of its rivals. Due to a serious miscalculation though, BMW practically sacrificed their entire firm to build this machine, and would spend the remainder of the following decade trying to regain the lost ground. The reality was, however, that the failure of the BMW 507 was a story that was actually decades in the making. BMW, or Bayerische Motorenwerke, was founded in 1916 as an aircraft engine manufacturer, but moved into the building of cars in 1928 with their first model, the Dixie 315, a license-built version of the Austin 7. BMW's first dedicated model was the 320, which was launched in 1932, and throughout the remainder of the decade, the company produced a slew of saloon and luxury sports cars, such as the 328 and the 335. Come World War II, though, BMW was forced to cease car production in order to assist in the war effort, dedicating their building capacity to the creation of aircraft engines for the Luftwaffe's fighters and bombers. Following Germany's defeat in 1945, though, the BMW firm had nearly ceased to exist. In the East, three of the company's factories were seized by the Soviet Union when Germany was divided, and those factories that remained in the West had been bombed out of commission. The company's main factory at Munich was almost completely destroyed, and, as part of a wider ban on Germany building cars and motorbikes, the BMW company spent its first post-war years producing kitchenware, such as pots and pans, kitchen supplies, and bicycles. While West German BMW production was banned by the Allies, many pre-war models returned to assembly at the factories that had been seized by the Soviet Union, with the 321 of 1938 and the 326 of 1936 being built by East German car builder Automobilwerk Eisenach. BMW's return to automobile production resumed in stages, first with the restart of motorbike production from 1948 with the R24, following permission being granted by the American authorities in charge of southern Germany. With motorbikes now being sold, BMW attempted to restart car building through possible deals with Ford of America and Simca of France to make licensed versions of their models, but these talks ultimately went nowhere. Eventually, BMW took two paths in their company development, which had been in receivership with several German banks since the end of the war. This move was dictated by a division among the management, with BMW chief engineer Alfred Burning being of the opinion that the only way to reverse the company's fortunes was to build a mass-market economical car that appealed to German families that couldn't afford a full-size car, taking inspiration from their earlier BMW 331 prototype, wherein a motorbike engine was placed inside a scaled-down car body. This consideration was countered by former banker and manager of the Opel plant, Hans Grevnig, who believed that due to the destruction of the company's Munich factory, as well as the other West German plants, the firm had not the construction capacity to make a mass-market eco-car, and should instead focus on the creation of luxury models aimed at the higher echelons of society. What resulted was the BMW 501 Luxury Saloon of 1952, the company's first post-war model, and a car that would bring in sizable profit margins through high retail prices and low production. The 501, however, was not a perfect machine, due largely to its pre-war derived six-cylinder engine being too underpowered for the heavy coach-built body the assembly of which was subcontracted to Bauer in Stuttgart due to delays in rebuilding the in-house facilities. The performance woes of the 501, combined with the added cost of outsourcing the construction of the bodywork, meant the car wasn't a commercial success. In 1954, BMW attempted to address the problem with the 502, which was fitted with the company's new 2.6-litre V8 engine. While this was powerful, it didn't help improve the profit margins for BMW in a sufficient quantity. Therefore, BMW turned to their economical concept, 
and bought the rights to build the 1953 Iso Izetta microcar, which entered sales from 1955 as the BMW Izetta. The Izetta was truly the moneymaker for BMW during the 1950s, with 10,000 units being sold during the first eight months of production, and a total of 161,728 units leaving the factory when sales ended in 1962. As for BMW's luxury aspirations, these would be determined by emerging trends for the creation of stylish but powerful European sports cars, with the most prominent market for these models being the United States. In 1956, America didn't sell sports cars in the same manner as European builders. The first generation Chevrolet Corvette, the C1, entered sales in June 1953, but due to a rush design and entry into production following enthusiasm for the EX122 prototype, the car was compared unfavourably to European equivalents. At the same time, small, cheap but economical sports cars were also selling healthily in America, including the likes of the MGA and the Triumph TR2, providing customers with inexpensive, road-going fun that was somewhat nimble. In this regard, BMW received the interest of Austrian-born New York-based car importer and dealer Max Hoffman, who had made a name for himself originally by selling Rolls-Royce and Bentley products in his home country. As the luxury and sports car industry was still a developing part of the motoring world, car makers of this period were largely under the influence of news they received from preeminent dealers in the United States and Europe, who would identify market trends before relaying their knowledge to European builders, who in turn would develop models based on their advice, which they would subsequently sell, taking a cut of the profit. Hoffman had directly influenced the development of the Mercedes 300 SL, identifying that there was a significant market in America for a two-seat luxury sports car, and in so doing turned the 300 SL into one of the most famous and successful models of the 1950s and early 60s. It was in this capacity that Hoffman turned to BMW, suggesting that the car maker build a fashionable sports car similar to that of the 300 SL for the American market, but for it to be priced at a cost of $5,000 or less. For ease of construction, the new car could also be based on the underpinnings of the preceding 502, as well as being fitted with the BMW V8 engine to deliver the power sought by American customers. In response, and having seen the success of the 300 SL, BMW committed themselves to Hoffman's proposal, and in 1955, the company unveiled the crisp and sublime 503, a two-door Grand Tourer designed by Albrecht von Goertz. The 503 was fitted with a 3.1-litre version of the BMW V8, and could reach a top speed of 115 miles an hour, while also attaining a 0-60 time of 13 seconds, which by the standards of the time, was a spectacular feat. While the 503 underwent development, BMW also approved the development of a dedicated two-seater sports car variant that would complement the 503 in the same manner as the 190 SL complemented the 300 SL. Once again, Albrecht von Goertz took the reins, and the 507 project was born. The 507 is based on a shortened version of the 503's frame, with the wheelbase having been reduced by 13 inches from 111 inches to 98 inches. In common with sports cars of the time, the car's overall height, with the roof up, was a mere 4 feet, and the overall weight of the car was 1.3 tons. This was largely owed to a lightweight construction, which was created through hand-formed aluminium that made every individual unit bespoke. This also applied to the hand-fabricated removable hardtop, which, due to the individual nature of each handcrafted unit, was incompatible with any other car of the range. In terms of structure, the car was fitted with double wishbone suspension with torsion bar springs and an anti-roll bar at the front, and a live axle with sprung torsion bars at the rear, located by a panhard rod and a central transverse A-arm to control acceleration and braking forces. Original 507s were fitted with Alfin drum brakes but these were later replaced by front girling disc brakes. For power, the car once again adopted a 3.1 litre version of the BMW aluminium alloy overhead valve V8, producing 150 horsepower. 
while this was largely the same as the 503, the car's lightweight construction meant it had a 0-60 time of 11.1 seconds and a top speed of 122 miles an hour. The resulting machine was beautiful and crisp, perfectly encapsulating the style and glamour of European luxury sports cars, and appeared to be well on its way to the same success as the rival 300 SL. Such was the enthusiasm for the 507 that the car made its debut at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York in the summer of 1955, while the more conservatively styled 503 was launched the same year at the Frankfurt Motor Show. The car was lauded by critics and customers, with Elvis Presley ordering two examples, and full-scale production began in November 1956. Sadly, the honeymoon period of the 507 wore off rapidly, once the estimated retail figures were revealed. Hoffman's proposal with BMW had been based on the understanding that the 507 would enter sales at $5,000, or $47,000 in 2020, with an estimated sales output, based on the previous 300 SL, of 5,000 units per annum. However, when taking into account the bespoke construction process, the 507 would only be able to cover its substantial building costs at a minimum of $9,000 per unit, or $84,000 in 2020. The results were alarming, and Hoffman, unable to guarantee any sales through his dealer network due to the massive price tag, withdrew from his contract to sell 507s in the USA, leaving BMW to try and sell the car through their own limited sales agents. Despite its beautiful styling and crisp performance, as well as the attractive BMW V8, the 507 struggled to pick up potential customers. The initial goodwill of the 507 at its launch in 1955, and the amount of enthusiasm forced onto the low-slung sports car, also doomed its 503 counterpart. The 503 was heavier, slower, and far less stylistic than the 507, while also having been pushed to the back upon its debut. As such, barely anyone had heard of the 503, and though it did sell in larger numbers than the 507, these weren't enough to secure a profit in the same manner as Mercedes-Benz with the 190SL and the 300SL. Continuing in unpopular production, the 503 was axed in 1959, followed a year later by the 507, the retail price of which had increased to $10,500, or $98,000 in 2020. In total, 416 503s and 252 507s have been built with BMW having made a loss on every unit sold. Eventually, BMW's overall loss on the 507 venture was 15 million Deutschmarks, or $3.57 million, equating to a loss of $33.6 million in 2020. What was meant to be the laying of a winning hand almost destroyed all the financial ground regained by the BMW firm, and the company teetered on bankruptcy once again, Compounded further by the enlarged Isetta microcar, the four-seat BMW 600, failing to sell, and a collapse in the motorbike market as the average income of German buyers increased, allowing them to buy full-sized family saloons. So dire was the situation at BMW that both American Motors, or AMC, and the Roots Group of Britain came calling, proposing to buy the ailing firm, while the company management also toyed with the idea of merging with Daimler-Benz. In the end, BMW focused what little income it had left on the development of highly economical family cars, resulting in the new class series of small saloons from 1962. The new class would go on to save BMW, providing reliable, efficient and practical machines that sold in substantial numbers across the globe. As for any attempt at building a luxury sports car or Grand Tourer, BMW returned to the realm of GT models in 1962 with the 3200 CS, but wouldn't create another sports car until the M1 of 1978, built in cooperation with Lamborghini. Looking back on the 507, it's hard to imagine that this supple car had almost brought a premature end to one of the world's most successful car makers. While such a machine should have been destined for sales success in the same manner as the 300 SL and the XK140, it instead hides a dark and tragic tale a labour of love so riddled with faults it was bound for self-destruction. 
This doesn't make the 507 any less of a car, though. It's still very beautiful, and its lines are a staple of that magnificent post-war era when some of the most lavish luxury cars were produced. At face value, it takes its place among the mighty as a gem of car design, but in terms of commercial success, that is a different matter entirely. Thanks again for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, why not leave a like, and be sure to subscribe for more great content. Thank you very much, take care, and I'll see you next time.